On Thursday, the junk bond market puked. In a chaotic day, prices fell, yields spiked, and the difference between those yields and U.S. Treasury yields, the so-called spread, widened painfully. The worst action was in deep junk, the riskiest, and until last September, the most glorious end of the bond market. The average yield of CCC and below-rated junk bonds spiked by a bone-chilling half a percentage point in just one day. Since early October, the average yield of CCC and below-rated junk bonds has jumped by nearly four percentage points, even as Treasury yields have fallen. Risk is getting repriced, and rather suddenly. What are the real-world consequences, and how will it impact stockholders? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Wolf Richter of WolfStreet.com, and you're listening to The Wolf Street Report. It's December 23rd, 2018. Since early November, and despite the Fed's rate hike path, the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield has inched down to about 2.8% now, down from 3.25% in early November. When yields fall, that means bond prices rise, and so these Treasury securities gained in value. This makes it cheaper for the government to borrow. But over precisely the same period, since early November, the opposite has started to happen in the junk-rated corporate debt markets, the junk bond market, in the leveraged loan market, a $2.6 trillion market in the U.S. alone. Suddenly, this end of the market has gotten the memos that the Fed started sending out on a regular basis two years ago. Throughout this rate hike cycle, the Fed has said it is raising rates because it wants financial conditions to tighten. And now, after markets had brushed off the Fed's efforts for two years, financial conditions are finally tightening, meaning that risk is getting repriced. The fact that the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield has fallen and that the price of those bonds has risen shows that investors have been enthusiastically buying them, eagerly accepting the lower yields of those so-called risk-free investments. One reason investors have been rushing to buy U.S. Treasury securities is to fly to safety as plunging stocks and other risk investments are teaching investors once again what the term risk actually means, that risk doesn't just mean prices surge all the time, but that the tide can turn and prices can plunge and can plunge faster than they surged. And spooked investors created a lot of selling pressures in risk assets, such as stocks, junk bonds, and leveraged loans, and conversely, a lot of buying pressure in the U.S. Treasury market. The selling pressure in the corporate debt markets hit junk bonds and leveraged loans the hardest. This is a $2.6 trillion market combined. Since early November, while the 10-year Treasury yield was falling, yields of junk-rated corporate debt was surging, making it more expensive and more difficult for these over-leveraged cash flow negative companies to borrow. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell at the post-meeting press conference last week made reference to this phenomenon several times when he said, and I quote, financial conditions have tightened a bit since the September meeting. With monetary policy, the Fed seeks to tighten or loosen the so-called financial conditions. Since the onset of QE and the Fed zero interest rate policy, financial conditions have been ultra loose, meaning that even the riskiest, most overleveraged companies with huge cash burns could always find investors to hand over their cash at a minuscule cost for the company so that companies could go out and burn it. Investors did this because the Fed surgically removed any possibility to make any reasonable return on less risky investments. The so-called chase for yield was on, in which more and more investors chased after riskier and riskier assets, thus driving up their prices and driving down their yields. Corporate borrowers took full advantage of this Fed-induced consensual insanity that has afflicted these investors and issued a record amount of junk debt. In December 2015, the Fed voted to change policy with its first rate hike in the cycle. A year later, in December 2016, it voted for its second rate hike 
and seeing how these yield-chasing investors were creating enormous risks, the Fed started to raise rates regularly in order to tighten these ultra-loose financial conditions and to remove some of this fuel that has fired up this enormous wave of blind risk-taking. But the opposite happened. Since December 2016, when the Fed got determined to remove this fuel, financial conditions have actually loosened. There's always a lag between changes in monetary policy and the transmission of those changes to the markets, to where financial conditions actually change. Monetary policy only becomes effective once it has been transmitted to the markets and changed the financial conditions. And this takes a while, typically about a year and a half. But because of the persistently gradual approach of the Fed, this has been the slowest rate hike cycle in history. The lag between changes in monetary policy and transmission to the markets has been the longest too, nearly three years. That's how long it took for financial conditions to begin to tighten from the ultra-loose level. But now, the transmission of monetary policy to the markets is happening in full force. These financial conditions can be tracked in a number of ways, including yields on riskier bonds and yield spreads between those riskier bonds and government bonds. This yield spread denotes how risk is being priced. For example, junk bonds rated triple C and below. This is deep junk that is closer to D for default than to the lowest investment grade category of triple B. These are very risky instruments where default is a significant chance. During the financial crisis, these bonds crashed. The average yield soared to over 40%. A number of these companies went bankrupt. Eventually, the average yield among the survivors fell back to below 10%. During the oil bust in 2016, there are a bunch of energy credits in this group. The average yield spiked to 22% as a gaggle of energy companies ended up in bankruptcy court. When the Fed got serious about rate hikes in December 2016, the oil bust was over and the average yield of triple C rated bonds and below had dropped to 12%. But as the Fed continued to raise rates and as treasury yields rose, the yields of those triple C rated bonds actually fell further thus narrowing the spread between them and treasuries. The yield eventually bottomed out at 9.5% in September 2018, with the spread to treasuries down to just 6.5%. This made triple C rated bonds one of the best investments since their bottom in February 2016. But then junk bond yields started to tick up. By November 26, the average yield hit 12% again, finally getting to the point where it had been when the Fed started raising rates. It sat there until December 5th, then ticked up again. By December 17, it was at 12.5%. Then yields suddenly spiked. And last Thursday, the market puked. The average yield jumped by over half a percentage point in just one day to 13.4% and the spread between triple C rated bonds and the treasury yield spiked by a half a percentage point to nearly 11 percentage points. The spread widened because treasury yields were falling even as these junk bond yields were surging. This is how risk is getting repriced. The actual risks have stayed the same, but investors suddenly woke up and demand a bigger price to take those risks. That's what the surging yield spread says. This isn't just an issue for investors whose bonds and leveraged loans and stocks are sinking in value. It's a huge issue for companies with real-world consequences. For over-leveraged, cash-flow-negative companies, the conditions that give them their junk credit rating, it's getting more expensive and more difficult to borrow. They suddenly find themselves in the world where funding their endless cash burn by borrowing more money becomes too costly or even impossible. This is where financial forces trigger defaults and bankruptcies. A cash flow negative company that cannot raise new funds to feed its cash burn will have to default on its existing debts and will either have to restructure these debts or liquidate. After record issuance of junk debt, many of these companies face a world where financial conditions have tightened. They will have difficulties refinancing these debts when they come due in 2019, 2020 and later. And they will become part of a powerful wave of defaults starting next year. 
But let's face it, the shakeout and cleanup of over-leveraged corporate America, even if painful, are long overdue. There are many companies in this group that will never be cash flow positive. There are many companies with too much debt. The wave of bankruptcies will free these companies from some of their debts and give them a fresh start. Other companies will be liquidated, thus making room for healthier competitors. This will blow out the cobwebs from the Fed-engineered credit bubble that lasted nearly a decade. But it will come at, a, at the expense of the investors. It will be painful for them, particularly those at the low end of the totem pole, namely stockholders and unsecured creditors or creditors secured by lousy collateral and other investors, those that have any liquidity left, will be able to pick up good assets for cents on the dollar. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Wolf Richter of WallStreet.com, and you listened to the Wall Street Report. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays.